All right, so uh, this follows on very closely from what David talked about. And in fact, I also had asked some questions in here, which will really be a test if you just listen to what David was telling you, because then you can just write down the answers. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So shame on you if you didn't, weren't listening. Um, uh, I also want to take, I, I recently, I was talking at a, at a different conference a couple of months ago, mentioning about covariances, and I said something like, you know, I'm sorry that these are so boring, but we have to focus on it, and was publicly uh, lambasted. Actually, cosmologists, so it is official, this is a really exciting topic. <laughs> <laughs> so in lieu of coffee, we're going to delve into a lot of mathematics to get you excited and, and waking up. So. Uh, we heard a little bit about the statistical definitions of covariance. I wanted to start to bring everyone on board by thinking about, here's a, here's a recent plot from the literature. It's exciting. We've got the dark energy equation of state and the mean mass density of the universe and constraints on it. But let's just talk through a little bit. What, what is being plotted here exactly? And how does this relate to the, the topic of this lecture? Covariance is, it's, it's deeply related. Um, and so we'll go into that now. And let's just take, a, take note that there are these, these banana-shaped contours. We've got uh, measurements from the CMB, CMB plus uh, galaxy clustering, and then plus supernovae and, and other uh, information, that BAO peak out of the galaxy clustering. So what we're doing is taking different surveys, combining information from them, and putting some kind of confidence contours on these cosmological parameters. And so, uh, just to say, this is really, these are kind of the, the dark shaded regions are intended to indicate one sigma contours. We sometimes say that it doesn't necessarily mean it's a Gaussian, but it's a 68% confidence interval integrating over uh, uh, quantile distributions of a, a 2D probability distribution. So how do we get there and what does that mean? And um, one important thing that will be helpful for us in talking about covariance matrices, as, as David talked about, is a covariance is really a quantity about a Gaussian distribution. So um, uh, it's important to make the connection that here is a, a skewed probability distribution. And if you zoom in around the peak, whatever curvature you have uh, starts to look like a Gaussian. And so if we can add more data points, that's like these uh, green contours are elliptical, but the blue contours are very non-elliptical banana shaped. And uh, just also to bring everyone on board, I'll be using this, this terminology uh, from Bayes' theorem, which uh, uh, is very familiar to some people and, and maybe uh, not the way that you're used to speaking uh, for other people. But uh, if we have a, a um, sorry, I skipped by, that we should really interpret these contours as the probability distribution of cosmological parameters theta given some data d, whatever that data is. And so we'll call that the posterior distribution. It comes out of this, this Bayes theorem relationship, where uh, uh, this is actually proportional to the probability distribution of the data given some asserted values for the cosmological parameters under some cosmological model, and then weighted by a prior distribution, which may be uh, trivial or non-trivial in whatever parameterization you're thinking of, so parameters theta. And so we'll be interested in, in thinking about what do these likelihood functions look like for certain data sets, and then what does the posterior distribution look like? And if I, if I just you know, uh, casually neglect the prior, I've, it's going to be some constant term that I don't have to think about, then these are really the same function, functional form, uh, but I just think of it as a function of theta or as a function of the data. And so we'll be uh, a little bit cavalier in that way. Um, so uh, the, the way that this kind of thinking starts to help us is to think we had their contours from different surveys, from the CMB and from large-scale structure, and uh, I can think about how exactly do I combine the information from two surveys to plot a contour on the same plot that this is the combination of those two. It uh, has something to do with the overlap of those contours, but mathematically, actually, uh, what we're doing is, is multiplying the probability distributions for uh, the data given the same cosmological model. So we're multiplying the likelihood functions for two different surveys. And the reason we can multiply this, I just wrote out here, we're making an assumption that the likelihoods factor, that the measurements from one survey, say the CMB, and the measurements from the other survey, the large scale structure, are statistically independent. This is a good uh, assumption to make, 
for two wildly different surveys. But let's say, as David said, you're measuring two uh, galaxy samples that are slightly different biased and maybe subject to similar systematics and so on. You may question this ability to factor the likelihood functions in this way. So it's useful to keep in mind when we're combining these data sets what, what is happening there. Can I multiply these functions or not? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, so that's, that's really intended to be explicitly indicated by this condition on theta. These are a given parameterization of a specific cosmological model, and this operation of multiplying them is indeed only valid if you have the same theta here and it's the same model, and, and, and if, if you don't, uh, it becomes a more complicated operation, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so, I want to immediately turn this around then and think about, okay, what if I consider this as a function of theta, not as a function of the data? So the cosmological parameters, there's some trivial prior that I'm, I'm glossing over, and uh, maybe this is a Gaussian, then I can write down, I know how to multiply Gaussian distributions, and this is fun, because then I get something I can look at and interpret, and what happens is that the joint likelihood of two data sets, here in this example, Boss and Planck, given some parameters theta, if each of the likelihoods is Gaussian function, has a Gaussian functional form in the cosmological parameters theta with different uh, covariance matrices, then there's this, this uh, Gaussian product rule. And the reason I wanted to write this down is that there's a covariance in this product, which is the, uh, we take the sum of the inverse uh, errors for each survey. And so that's, that kind of, uh, makes sense. If I've got large errors, then that contributes little information into the joint likelihood or joint posterior distribution, and small errors contribute more information. And then the mean uh, of the uh, estimated cosmological parameters, where does that contour sit, is an inverse noise-weighted sum of the means from the two surveys. So uh, um, I think this is all eminently sensible, but but thinking about, okay, I understand why I would do such an operation to combine information from two surveys. What I'm doing is I'm assuming that the uh, uh, likelihood functions for each survey are Gaussian functions of the cosmological parameters. I'm multiplying them together, assuming statistical independence, and then I'm using this mathematical relationship. You can, I didn't do the math here, but you can, you can complete the square and the exponent of the Gaussian and derive this for yourself. It takes a few minutes. And, and I'm using this relationship for the product of two Gaussian densities to understand what the resulting mean and uh, covariance have to be. So, so the mean is a matrix. Can you just use the matrices? These are, yes. I, I've, these would be, so in the, in the case of this, this plot, I have a two-dimensional parameter space, W and omega matter. Theta so the, the theta is two-dimensional. And uh, the C's are two by two matrices. Um, I think we'll walk through this a little bit next. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This comma right here? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I meant to describe that and I did not. This notation is sometimes used in statistics literature as a G or an N. This means Gaussian distribution or an N would be normal distribution, same name for the same thing. The subscript means it's a function, it's a distribution in the parameter theta, and then the first argument is the mean, and the second argument is the covariance. And as we talked about, that those two parameters completely specify the Gaussian distribution. And so I, I think of a Gaussian distribution as an argument of two functions, and then I specify that. Uh, yeah, these are actually matrix multiplications. So this is a 2D matrix multiplying a... Yeah, that's right. So, so what you do to get the mean, you do an invert... I'm, if I imagine that these Cs are diagonal, then it's just variances. I do like an inverse noise weighted sum of the means. And then actually, I, uh, if nothing else, the units are wrong now. So I have to multiply by another variance to get rid of the units of the variance again, and the, the natural one has to be the, the covariance of the combined sum. So, uh, yeah, so theta can be, uh, we commonly work in like a order six to eight dimensional cosmological parameter space. 
um, could be more. Um, this, this reasoning applies. So actually, now let me break it down. I, I wanted to do a, a quick thought exercise. I think this is uh, uh, familiar to some, but probably not to everyone. So if I do have a matrix C that's just two-dimensional, two uh, I might parameterize it commonly with the variance of, uh, let's call this the variance of omega matter. Maybe sigma 2 is the variance of W. So those are my two parameters. And then there's this correlation parameter, rho, that uh, David was talking about that can go uh, typically have uh, uh, between minus 1 and 1. So you could have negative or positive correlations. And then since this is a variance, not a correlation matrix, it actually gets scaled by the, uh, the diagonal variance components. And so we saw on these plots, I have an ellipse. How do I understand how big this is? And what's the relative orientation of this ellipse relative to the uh, parameter axes? And it's completely determined by combinations of these two components of this uh, matrix. So maybe just uh, take a minute or two. I'll set a short timer to think or talk amongst yourselves. Can you write down what's the area of the confidence ellipse from this covariance matrix, and what's its orientation for values of these parameters? Um, All right, am I? Uh, yeah. uh, well, I've I've got a. Uh, it's just going to beep for two minutes. So I just said two minutes now. I, I don't want to. Oh, uh, drag me off when. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. I, yeah, I was just tangling myself. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I should, uh, da, 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 da. where's the, this one? Okay, so, um, I, let's come back now. Uh, there's some math to derive. I'll show you in just a second. Um, but also, I, I linked on the Confluence page a little widget that you can, you can explore how varying these parameters changes. So here's a, uh, it's a, oops, what did I do there? Here's some, uh, an, an ellipse for two parameters, theta one, theta two, and you can drag these sliders to see, okay, if I increase sigma one, ah, it's not gonna work on the, the um, ellipse gets bigger. If I turn the correlation uh, negative, it should turn, change its orientation and get skinnier. Um, so. There's this kind of scaling, as we expect. A lot of this is uh, um, fairly intuitive once you, once you look at it. Um, but please go have a look there. And let me, uh, let me then just show you what the, oops. So here's the way to think about the math, or one way to think about it. You, we started with this covariance matrix. Um, and what I want to understand is that I have an ellipse that's oriented some, along some uh, coordinate axes that are rotated with respect to my cosmological parameter axes. And so uh, I can write down, I want to I wanna actually expand the covariance as uh, a rotation operator times some diagonal covariance matrix. Um, 
And now, I have to apologize a little bit. There are pictures one could draw here, and I am not a, a visual learner, and I was thinking, <laughs> let me, I'll just bring you along into my, uh, I, I prefer the equation. So if you are a visual <laughs> learner, um, uh, I hope you'll uh, appreciate another way of looking at understanding this problem. Uh, so so the, the way I would think about it is this, this is the 2D rotation operator. And uh, because I have a matrix, I have to multiply it left and right. The transpose is its inverse. Um, and then uh, that this rotation operator should rotate into some axes where I have zero off-diagonal terms. That means I've taken the coordinate axis for the ellipse and just moved it so that uh, the x-axis is along the semi-major axis and the y-axis is along the semi-minor axis of the ellipse. And once that's true, I know, I know that the area of the ellipse is just uh, um, sigma 1 times sigma 2, up to factors of pi and so on. And then uh, the angle, the orientation of the ellipse, is exactly this angle phi down here. So you can multiply this out, gives you a series of three equations to solve for three variables, and you get these formulae. So there you go. That's one, that's one way to... Uh, and actually, I, I have to say that, uh, you know, I, I'm used to thinking of these contours all the time, but uh, I would not tell you these formulae off the top of my head. Think about it. There, here's an arc tangent. Um, just we can see that uh, when sigma one equals sigma two, this goes to infinity, and we always get an angle of zero. That means I have a circle. There is no orientation defined, and then uh, its angle is dependent on increasing or decreasing the correlation parameter rho. And then here, uh, if rho is zero, so I'm I'm actually aligned with my coordinate axes. The area is just pi times a d, the area of ellipse, the formula we're all familiar with. Um, so uh, you can see the widget that's linked and play with that if, if these equations are indeed non-intuitive. So uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the Fisher matrix for relating. We've been talking about the parameter covariance matrix, the covariance of the cosmological parameters and creating confidence ellipses. But uh, uh, we have to also connect with the, the errors on the data, whatever that may be, and, and we'll focus here just on the uh, correlation function of the power spectrum, the two-point correlation function or power spectrum. And so the Fisher matrix is, is defined here uh, in terms of thinking, well, I have a likelihood function. It's a function of the data conditioned on some cosmological model. And if I measure via the second derivatives the curvature of that function, that gives me some estimate of the spread or the width or the, the uncertainty of that function. And so we just define, actually, the Fisher matrix is the, the expectation value of the uh, curvature of the log likelihood evaluated at the maximum likelihood value for the cosmological parameters. So I, I take derivatives of the likelihood function, but as a function of parameters, cosmological parameters, and construct a matrix. And these indices A and B uh, index which uh, parameter I'm talking about, so omega matter or W or more parameters if I want to talk about that. And since this is a curvature, it's, uh, I take one over the curvature. Um, flatter curvature means larger error bars. So this is actually an estimate of the inverse covariance matrix of the probability of the distribution of the parameters given the data. That's the Fisher matrix. And so uh, there's actually a, a theorem called the kramer rao bound that says this is the ideal lower bound on the uh, measurement errors on our cosmological parameters uh, conditioned on you know, a particular survey, the particular data vector d that we've put in here, and the functional form of the likelihood. So if I give you those three things, what's the, what's the survey geometry and its parameters, what's the likelihood function, and what am I using to, dis to summarize the information in that survey, then I can calculate the Fisher matrix and tell you, OK, under that scenario, this is the best you could ever do at measuring uh, these cosmological parameters. Um, uh, over here, right. So, um, I, I don't know. Did you? Over universe realizations. Yeah, I think it's. Um, um, again, we. I. I think. Uh, we just have an um, ensemble of universes, as you described in your last lecture. And, and so, right, there's going to be some fluctuation in that data vector that we have, to, we have to calculate. So, for example, I think a way to make that clear is if, 
if there's a term in here that's just d, then uh, if, it's, if it's the density, then that has a mean of zero by construction, as you said. And so this expectation would take whatever actual realized density you have and take it to zero to its mean. Or we have a mean uh, power spectrum with fluctuations about it that we'll discuss, and that would, that would uh, um, bring that down. Uh, okay, yeah, that, I guess that's your procedure for how you generate abstractly the ensemble of universals over which you're averaging, right? So it's, it's overall balance between the state and the power, how you can think about it. Is it a mathematical theory or a numerical theory? Yeah, it's, it's a mathematical theorem. So the mathematical theorem says that you can optimize for that theory. Well, I mean, intuitively, it's just saying you've got some, fun, some likelihood function, which is a probability function of the data, under, a, under particular modeling assumptions, you can never measure, if you consider it as a function of parameters theta, it's got some curvature, some width at its peak. You can never measure those parameters much tighter than the width of the probability distribution. I, there's, there's no information available. That's your statistics. So that, that's all it's saying, really. Yeah, you have, to, you have to be explicit, what is D? Is it a correlation function estimator over a given um, uh, range of support with a particular binning, et cetera? It depends on all of those assumptions. But. Yeah, and, th and this is quantitatively what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Yes, thank you. So, um, um, there. Uh, okay, so let's, let's be a little bit more explicit here. And I'm going to take the data vector to be the two-point correlation function, denoted by the symbol C, as David described. And now um, uh, it has a Gaussian likelihood function, and I'm going to abuse notation. So C is now uh, the covariance of the, uh, the um, correlation function C, not the covariance of the theta. And I'm, I'm doing this uh, um, in part because uh, if you go look up any literature anywhere, the same uh, abusive notation is, is throughout. So you just have to get used to uh, interpreting in the context of what you're reading what the covariance is a covariance of. Um, so, so for this likelihood function, I know how to remember the Fisher matrix. I have to take derivatives of it. So I can do that. And if I have the, the uh, cosmological dependence in this likelihood function is in the mean of the correlation function, that's the mean over an ensemble of universe realizations, then I take derivatives of this, of the logarithm of this, and I get uh, an estimate for the Fisher matrix that looks like this. So I've got derivatives of the mean correlation function C, and then times the inverse covariance matrix. And we've been a little bit more explicit about what indices I'm summing over. The, the i and the j are bins and angle, um, and the a and the b are cosmological parameters, and so on. So this is just an easy way to say that I've got some cosmology dependence, and then this is an inverse noise again, and it's telling us what angular scales in the uh, correlation function are contributing the most and the least information to my inverse error on the cosmological parameters. Remember, Fisher is the inverse error on the cosmological parameters, as we described here. So um, uh, this is a simple result, but gives us uh, a little bit more intuitive understanding of what's going on here. Um, whoop. Yeah. Yes, that's absolutely it. And uh, uh, that's, an, yeah, a brief exercise coming up. So it is an, it's an important question, actually. What is, uh, how do we understand that ensemble? And so in the past, uh, for lack of any better options, like a big computing power, uh, people might have chopped up their survey and, and you know, used some uh, ergodic hypothesis to average over subvolumes and try to estimate these, uh, these averages. But 
we know that that's flawed. And a better thing to do, probably, is if we can simulate it, uh, well enough the, the universe and what we're looking at to, to do that. And then there's the question of or what's the space of input seeds and, and models and so on, um, which maybe I'll have time to get to. Uh, I had actually, um, it's not appearing here, but there's another term that can exist here. And that's if, uh, when I took derivatives, I, I said, well, theta only comes into this likelihood function here in the uh, two-point correlation function. But in principle, actually, and quite commonly, there's no reason that also the other parameter in this Gaussian distribution, C, why doesn't this depend on theta? And if it does, when I take derivatives of the likelihood function, there's got to be more stuff over here. And um, uh, I think I need to download an updated version of these slides to see it, but it, sh it should be on the web. And so as an example, I'll just this is a plot out of a uh, uh, cosmic shear analysis that tried to use different assumptions for that uh, the cosmology dependence in this covariance. So if now we interpret C as the cosmic shear two-point correlation function, and we let theta uh, exist as a dependency in the covariance matrix, then all I, this is now sigma eight versus uh, the mean mass density omega matter. And you can see that under different modeling assumptions, these contours shift, but really they're only along a uh, degeneracy direction that's well known in cosmic shear for these parameters. And so uh, I'll just pose the question and not answer it right now. Why does that happen? that you let the covariance be a function of cosmology, and you can shift along a parameter degeneracy direction, but there's not large shifts in the orthogonal direction. So something to think about. Maybe we can discuss over lunch or something. So, um, yeah. So I, I've seen box combining things like this many times, and I've always been a little unclear. Why does the parameter degeneracy direction always seem to be curved like this? They've uh, always been on it. Uh, and it looks there, or maybe just my eyes. It is, it looks like a banana. It is banana shaped. Uh, well, let's ask why do you think it should be a straight line? <laughs> well, let me ask it a different question. I've, I've plotted sigma A to omega matter. What if I uh, redefine my cosmological parameters? to be some uh, nonlinear function of sigma eight. Would you still expect a straight line in that parameter space? Another question we were trying to think about is what might set a floor on sigma eight? Because you can see something pushing the contours to not to really flatten out. Floor. Right. So sigma eight is like the answer he was just giving. Right. So, well, um, There's, there's a lot of things to discuss here, but it's not what I want to focus on. So, so let's, let's discuss that later and leave those open questions. Yeah. That's right, right. Well, I'm going to come back to this uh, to tell, show you how the Fisher matrix is, how we're using it now, actually, and later this week to... Uh, understand what and how many simulations to run to estimate the covariance matrices for LFST and other surveys. So it's a useful tool that way as well. Um, uh, let me come back to that. So I just wanted to highlight briefly that uh, we, we've been talking about uh, Gaussian distributions for the data and a covariance matrix. And um, uh, it's important to think now about uh, the context of this for the large scale structure. Here's some some panels showing an in-body, a cosmological in-body simulation, the millennium simulation at different times. So I'm starting at early times and then stepping uh, one, two, three, four down to uh, the present day. 
And the key feature to take away here is that this mass density looks very smooth at early times, and it gets more and more uh, cosmic web-like as time goes on. And so uh, we call this the growth of gravitational perturbations as time goes on. Mass is collapsing under its own gravity, and it's becoming uh, more inhomogeneous. Uh, clearly, sitting here at this density peak is different from sitting over here in this, in this empty region. So it's locally inhomogeneous, and there's, there's some large smoothing scale and that, that uh, brings you back to a regime of approximate homogeneity. And so it's important to understand what that is. And this has uh, large implications for the covariance of the data vectors that you're using, whether it's the density or the correlation functions of that density. And so um, let me just highlight first that, as David mentioned, uh, we're starting the initial conditions for the mass density in the universe from the, the uh, paradigm of inflation where we're generating uh, density perturbations um, uh, from quantum fluctuations that are you know, expanded beyond our horizon and frozen in, and that the, the key thing is that these are supposed to be Gaussian distributed. And if you've got a Gaussian homogeneous uh, density field, then um, uh, that has certain statistical properties that we can characterize. But the, the first one that, that I like to think is, here I've made a, a very coarsely gridded uh, density field of a projected mass map. Uh, this is actually a, a simulation of lensing convergence. Um, and this is Gaussian distributed. What do I mean by that? Well, it, uh, there's lots of ways to interpret that, but a simple one is say, just take all these pixel values and histogram them, and that's over here, and uh, it's well fit by a Gaussian distribution, the, the centers of the histogram value. So um, uh, it's, it's a simple concept when we say Gaussian distributed field, and I could do this in 3D or ND or whatever. So, um, uh, very quickly, I, I'm not sure if I want to spend time on this or not because David actually told us the answers to these questions in exercise two. Let me just read them out first. So, uh, let me, actually, for question A, let me ask the audience, can someone tell me what's the covariance matrix look like for the Fourier transform of a homogeneous Gaussian random field? Was anyone listening to his lecture? Um, what is that? It's diagonal, right. So this is, this is the, uh, um, the, the diagonal covariance that David talked about, and it's, uh, the diagonal entries are given by the power spectrum of the mass density field. Okay, so now question B. Um, I, I'm talking about measuring the two-point correlation function or the power spectrum. That's my data vector. What's that covariance look like under the same set of assumptions? I've got a homogeneous and isotropic Gaussian random field. What is the structure in that covariance matrix? What do I expect? And so maybe I'll give you just a, a minute or two to think of amongst yourselves or see if you can write down something, what, what you think that is, and then I'll show it on the next slide. What's the power, covariance matrix of the matter power spectrum? And can you think of how that relates to your understanding of the Gaussian properties of the mass density field? <laughs> 
one way to think about uh, writing down an answer for this. Um, so, so we can start that uh, actually David's old slides from 2006, I think, had this equation. And we didn't, we didn't quite see this again. But uh, did we? The delta function? Was that? OK. I wasn't listening, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Excuse me. So, so uh, if you have the, the matter density field, delta, in a Fourier space, so it's a function of wave vector k, then I can take the expectation value of the product of two deltas. This expectation value, again, is the average over an ensemble of universes. And because uh, we have this homogeneous assumption that it really has to be a function just of the wave vector k, and so I, I have this Dirac delta function that relates, oops, I, I missed a prime over here. So I've got k and k prime, excuse me. So now, uh, this is the definition of the matter power spectrum. And now I say, all right, I've got an estimator for the matter power spectrum. And I want the covariance of that estimator. What does that look like? Well, I go back to the definition of variance. So I, I take my estimator with a hat on it, subtract off the mean value, and take a, a product, a square of that. So this is depending on wave vector k. This is depending on wave vector k prime. Take that expectation over an ensemble of universes. And then uh, the first thing I can do is just multiply out the different terms. So I can take out the means, because the expectation of the mean is the mean. So, so this line is, is just multiplying out the, uh, the different terms in this cross product. And then what I really want to highlight is that if I plug in here uh, for um, p hat this definition, that it's a product of two deltas, then what I have here is an expectation of p hat times p hat. That's a product of four delta terms. And they have particular wave vector dependencies. I've got a k, a k, a k prime, a k prime. And I didn't highlight for you at the moment that in this definition, actually, I've got a complex conjugation here. This is how we define the power spectrum. Uh, but because of the reality condition of the mass density field, the complex conjugate uh, can be written as just taking a minus sign of the wave vector. So those are, those are the same operations. Um, and so I, I could remove this complex conjugate and change this minus sign to a plus sign and have everything be the same. So now, uh, the fun part of this exercise is thinking about what the heck is this here. And this ties in a little bit to uh, Chris Walter's uh, question during David's talk that this is the four-point function. And I have to know, how do I simplify that? How do I understand that? And way, one way to understand that is actually, instead of a, uh, um, you know, averaging over an ensemble of universes, I can write it as a product, I should have erased this, a, um, an integral over a probability distribution. So if I've got you know, delta 1, 2, 3, 4 in some shorthand, this is an integral of the, the probability distribution, the joint probability distribution of all of these uh, random variables. And then I, I want actually uh, moments of this. And then I'm integrating with respect to each of these. And so the question about how to simplify this four-point function is really, how does, uh, does this factor in any meaningful way, this joint probability distribution function? And so this is another way to think about. And this is the probability of the joint uh, um, mass density realizations over different universes. I'm just integrating over that probability distribution function. And so if, if we assume that this is a Gaussian, this probability distribution function, then we know that it's completely described by the two-point function properties. And so what I can start to do is uh, expand this in sums of all the pairings of the deltas. So this I can write as delta 1, delta 2, expectation value times delta 3, delta 4. And what this means is that I've assumed that this probability distribution function has a term in its expansion that factors into the joint probability of two deltas times the joint probability of the other two deltas. And then uh, uh, I actually, if it factors that way, I have to sum over all permutations of this. So delta 1, delta 3 times delta 2, delta 4. And then there's one more, delta 1, delta 4, delta 2, delta 3, and so on. And actually, um, uh, these are all the two-point pairings that I can do. So I've, I've finished those two points. And under the Gaussian assumption, 
there isn't a three or a, a, um, a unique four-point function to consider. And of course, remember, this is the definition of delta. There's no one-point function to consider. So I'm done. That's it for the Gaussian. Just those three terms summed. And uh, I did that over here. Here are the three different terms with the k pairings, as they actually happen for this was more general with one, two, three, four, but these have only k and k prime in them. And so when this comes out at the end of the day, what you have is the covariance of the power spectrum estimator as a product of two deltas is in fact just the square of the power spectrum and then times delta functions depending on uh, whether the wave vectors are aligned or anti-aligned in 3D space. And so uh, the covariance of the power spectrum is the square of the power spectrum. This looks familiar because the covariance of delta, which is Gaussian, is the square of delta, i.e. the power spectrum. And so uh, with these Gaussians, we can just pl keep playing this game over and over again. And the reason that we've run in a big circle like this is that we implicitly here assumed that the power spectrum estimator is Gaussian distributed, even though that's not true. If delta is Gaussian distributed, its two-point function is not Gaussian distributed. And we'll talk about what that distribution exactly is uh, in just a, a couple of slides later. But, but it's important to understand we'll, we make this approximation all the time, saying, well, at whatever level of turtles down I am, I'm still calling everything a Gaussian likelihood function and doing the same statistics. But it's only strictly correct for the Gaussian density field, which happens in linear theory. So, and, uh, Note here, I've, I've made a notation we'll come back to in just a second that I can put a subscript C here that says the connected term uh, we've assumed is zero. And that's when I say that this probability distribution function, if there's a term that can't factor, I have to have all the deltas together and there's, there's nothing that separates them. The joint probability doesn't factor apart. And we'll come back to that in just a second. So uh, let's just remember then that, um, uh, I'm losing my microphone. Under the uh, assumption of a Gaussian likelihood for the power spectrum estimator, the covariance is diagonal, and uh, it's um, uh, only depending on the power spectrum. I use the square of the power spectrum, so that's good. We've uh, um, uh, this is quite a general result that we can rely on, and and David talked about the utility of the correlation function uh, in practice, which I completely agree with, especially when we start talking about survey window functions and so on. But if you're a theorist and you can uh, set your survey window function to one, then the power spectrum is a great thing to work with for these reasons. Uh, so now let me uh, just be a little more explicit about the power spectrum estimator. I kept using that term without defining exactly what that means. Um, so uh, under this isotropy condition, the power spectrum, we, we heard from David, should not depend on the orientation of the wave vector k. It should only depend on its magnitude. It means all uh, points in space, all directions in space are equivalent. And so if I estimate a power spectrum as the product of two deltas, I should be able to average over the orientation of this wave vector k. Um, and so that's what we call the shell average power spectrum. I average over shells of wave vector such that they have the same magnitude, approximately so, but uh, their, their uh, phase is different. And so uh, we define it this way. If there are n k modes in a shell for a fixed k magnitude, I just sum over those modes, average over them, and that gives me my shell average power spectrum estimator. That's now a function of uh, wave number k, not wave vector k. And those modes in uh, 3D space are just you know, counting the volume of a thin spherical shell. Okay. So nk. And then the covariance gets scaled by this. So you can see that uh, there's a choice of binning delta k. What's the width of my bins in k space? And by choosing a bigger binning, I can make nk bigger, and I can reduce the covariance in the power spectrum. Um, and for the Gaussian field, this is a, a smart thing to do if you're not losing otherwise cosmological information. Yes, thank you. V is the volume of the survey. And also, uh, it's needed there for units, if nothing else. Right. Um, okay, but here's the important thing, that uh, we do not measure in a galaxy survey or in a weak lensing survey, as, as Booth said, we do not measure the linear Gaussian density field. Uh, the CMB does to a good approximation in its temperature and isotropies, but the, the mass traced by uh, lensing and, and the galaxy distribution is non-Gaussian. That means it's collapsed under gravity. And in fact, the way we can understand that is that it's created this four-point function that is not entirely separable. And so now it's useful to think about 
what does this term look like if it doesn't factor apart into products of two-point functions? Um, and so we call this alternately the connected four-point function or the tri-spectrum. And so the particular configuration of the four-point function that occurs in that power spectrum, the covariance of the power spectrum estimator looks like this. I had k, k, k prime, k prime. And I've, because of these complex conjugations, I have to insert a minus sign. Uh, wherever there's a star, I turn that into minus k. And so this tri-spectrum, I just write it down. It's a function of four uh, wave vector arguments. And so, and it has these k's. And so, actually, if you, if you were to draw out these wave vectors, the, these close and make a parallelogram. So I can think about, uh, instead of uh, the two-point function being the distance between two points, um, so David had something like this. Now I have, um, this is the tri-spectrum configurations. And I would find all configurations of four points on the sky and average over the locations and orientations of this. That shouldn't matter because that's homogeneity and isotropy. And then the different values of k. So this could be wave vector k, and this would be wave vector k prime. And then I, I average over uh, um, um, the, the tri-spectrum will have different uh, sizes depending on what combinations of wave vectors I'm using. So what's the covariance of different scales in the power spectrum? And uh, uh, I didn't have time to go into this here, but you can derive some expressions for this tri-spectrum, say, under cosmological perturbation theory. Or if you think of the HALO model, you can start to write down, uh, well, combined with perturbation theory results. Or people used to do this under the hierarchical cl clustering ansatz, which now we know is not a very good description of the mass density. But there are different ways you can think about what might this connected four-point function look like. And it means this pro joint probability distribution function is connected. It cannot factor into a product of, I can't take the four arguments in here and factor it into a product of functions of smaller numbers of arguments. It's connected together. That's, that's what it means. Uh, yeah, and that's because uh, um, I don't have arbitrary four wave vectors in here. I have two of them that are the same with opposite sign, and then another one that's the same but with opposite sign. So it must always be a parallelogram configuration that contributes to the covariance of the power spectrum estimator. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Right. <laughs> I like where you're going with this. Uh, we should do cosmology measurements from the matter tri-spectrum. Yeah. That would be great. Or test general relativity. Unfortunately, and it looks like I'm going to run out of time, but uh, uh, we can't even predict this thing with enough accuracy in standard cosmology. Um, it's just it's a really hard thing to calculate. And uh, I'll try to rush to just get to how we try to calculate that. If you could, though, that'd be awesome. Um, uh, so it's important to note, I talked about the shell average power spectrum estimator. So we actually have to take that tri-spectrum, which, which is a function of these wave vectors, and average it over the shells, too. And so then the covariance matrix of the power spectrum becomes a sum of two terms. This uh, shell average term, which is the, the <coughs> contribution from the uh, linear theory, from the Gaussian approximation for the density field, and then when the tri-spectrum becomes important, uh, I also have this term. And the key thing here is that there's a k sub i and k sub j now in these two uh, bins, whereas this term is diagonal. It has a Kronecker delta ij. This one can be off-diagonal. And so I take what was a diagonal covariance matrix for the power spectrum, and I add off-diagonal terms. What that means is that I introduce from gravitational clustering correlations in different wave bands of the power spectrum. And that means now my inferences from the linear power spectrum and the nonlinear power spectrum are coupled together. And I have, to, I have to properly account for that in my likelihood function. Yeah, that's because I've done a, an awful uh, shell averaging procedure on this beast. Um, 
for no reason except that that's my estimator and I want to plug it in here. And actually, I, I, another thing I didn't have time to talk about, but we may on Tuesday or Wednesday at this meeting, is that this has is, this is actually recently been understood to be critically flawed in that uh, integrating over those angles and configurations of the parallelograms actually neglects a term which is, in some sense, the dominant contribution to the power spectrum ver variance on all scales of interest. That's called super sample covariance. You can go Google it, because uh, there's not time to get into it here. But it's, it's a mode coupling between large and small scale modes that uh, contributes to the proper averaging procedure of this, this tri-spectrum as a function of wave number, or these configurations of these parallelograms, to, to turn them into something that's uh, contributing to the covariance of the shell-averaged power spectrum estimator. I think so. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a fun question to think about. When do those derivatives become comparable to the cosmological information from the mean data vector? Um, I, I don't think that's, that's well quantified. OK, so let me show you some pictures just to understand. This is uh, from a, sim a paper that did a simulation of 1,000 in-body simulations and just calculated the matter power spectrum. And then uh, they're plotting here the covariance of the power spectrum divided by the Gaussian term. So the Gaussian term, 2 p squared over nk, we divide by 2 p squared over nk. And so this should, these plots should just be uh, straight lines at 1 if there's no nonlinear growth or no uh, nonlinear contributions to the matter power spectrum covariance matrix. And what you can see is three redshifts, redshift 3, 1, and 0. And what happens is that the variance on nonlinear scales as we go to higher wave number is getting larger and larger, which means uh, we're having more nonlinear growth. The variance is increasing beyond what you would predict with the Gaussian theory. And then you, these lines are perturbation theory and halo model. You can show that, see that you know, they do approximately right, but not, not percent level precision. That's not the kind of thing we can calculate. This, here's the off-diagonal. So here's the rows of the correlation matrix. And it shows that at uh, redshift 3, uh, there's this spike. This is just the, the diagonal part of that row of the correlation matrix. It must be 1. But then you go across, and at redshift 3, it's pretty flat. You don't have many correlations between different scales in the power spectrum at high redshift. But as uh, cosmology, as the universe uh, progresses, and you've got more matter clustering, more growth of inhomogeneities, these correlations, which were zero, start to grow larger and larger. And in fact, as you get the correlations with small scales are more correlated with all scales in the power spectrum than the large scales in the power spectrum, which are more weakly correlated with the small scales. Um, yes, so uh, the, these perturbation theory lines, so the solid lines that are trying to model this, that's a, a tree-level perturbation theory prediction for the tri-spectrum that you're seeing right there. It actually, it's not always doing such a great job here, but out here, it's doing a pretty good job. Um, and then you can try to correct it with these halo model stuff, but yeah, that's the tri-spectrum <laughs> coming in. Uh, yes, yeah, it's a correlation coefficient. Yeah, I've, I've not seen negative correlations in that, yeah. Um, so one more quick point I want to make is that we said the, the power spectrum estimator we're modeling it as a, as a Gaussian likelihood function. And that actually is a good thing because our estimator is the shell average. We're summing over lots of products of density estimators. And we'll invoke the central limit theorem here to say that even though the power spectrum may not be Gaussian distributed to high approximation, and especially on large scales it's not, um, the power spectrum estimator averaging over shells is well approximated by a Gaussian distribution. And actually, you can check this in these simulations. Works well on all the scales. So check we're OK using a Gaussian likelihood function for the matter power spectrum shell averaged estimator. Um, now, uh, here's some other plots just showing actually covariances. You have to worry about real versus redshift space, other noise sources, and so on. So let me just quickly give an idea of now that we understand what terms have to contribute to the covariance, why it's important. How are we going to calculate one of these things? Um, and so I'm not, I'm not going to break for this exercise time, but I said 
let's say we're going to use simulations to calculate the galaxy power spectrum covariance by running in-body simulations. What do I do? Is there some output I can save from the in-body simulations? Do I run an ensemble of them? How do I process them? And uh, I, I wanted to enumerate this mostly to impress upon you, first of all, that it's a complex procedure. It's uh, calculating the covariance takes a lot of time and effort. And we do things like generating a realization of the ma initial conditions of the mass density on a qubit grid, given the linear power spectrum, a specified seed out of a pseudo-random number generator, and some periodic volume and grid spacing. It's important to be explicit about all these things because our predictions later on are, are conditioned on the assumptions we've made in step one. We set up mass tracer particles. We evolve them according to uh, Newtonian gravitational interactions in a uh, expanding background. Um, uh, some of these assumptions have been checked, probably okay. And then, you know, if we're doing the galaxy power spectrum, we have to find gravitationally bound dark matter halos, populate galaxies in them, put those, construct those into an observable light cone. We don't observe a volume all at fixed time. We're, we're looking at uh, increasingly uh, um, earlier times as we look further back along the line of sight. Then uh, out of that light cone we've constructed very laboriously, you it's important to apply the actual window function of the survey that you have because that gets convolved with your density and your power spectrum estimators. Phew, I'm glad I got through all this work. This took me millions of CPU hours and you know, lots of time. Okay, now go back and repeat steps one through seven to obtain a million samples of that so you can estimate the covariance. And the million uh, we can talk about later, but actually people have said numbers of 10 to the four to 10 to the six sample re repetitions of steps one through seven. So this is, this is the challenge that uh, um, the desk and other surveys are facing that we're talking about in the covariance sessions. Well, no, I, let me advertise, uh, some of us may be working on a hack on Friday on what are smart choices for that. Um, okay, Phil's telling me I'm, I'm um, out of time. Let me introduce one last concept. The sample covariance estimator, uh, which is defined here in this bottom box. And this is really just, if I have n sub r samples, independent samples via simulation of my universe, of my survey, I can average I can calculate the power spectrum in each sample, indexed by i, and then average them together to obtain an estimate of the covariance matrix. And this is the same way you estimate the variance of a set of data points, is just now the covariance. Uh, you can show that this is the maximum likelihood estimator for the covariance C. And uh, part of that derivation, which I will skip, but you can see the slides, is, is thinking of the joint likelihood for all those power spectra out of all my simulated universes as a product of the individual likelihoods which is Gaussian distributed. Um, uh, there's an, I'll point out there's an expert in the room, Benjamin Yoahimi here, who's written lots of papers about this that were cited, that you can derive actually a sampling distribution, uh, something called the Wieschart distribution for the sample covariance estimator, and thereby define the covariance on your covariance of your covariance, i.e. the eight-point function that describes the errors on the sample covariance estimator and that's useful in un understanding um, how much uh, uh, noise you expect for a given number of simulated uh, universes and how much is tolerable there. So um, I guess I'm really done. Uh, let me, let me, um, the, the final point I was gonna make coming back is, is that you can use the Fisher matrix to show from your eight point function that you calculated out of, out of this Wieschart distribution that if I have an error, i.e. I've run a non infinite set of simulated universes, say I only ran 10,000 of them, that leads to an error in my sample covariance estimator for my survey, and that propagates directly into increased error bars on your cosmological parameters. And so uh, I can then define, if I don't want to be, if I want uh, the degradation in my constraining power on sigma eight to be less than 20%, I now know I have to run this number of simulations. Uh, in order out of this uh, error distribution modeling. And so this is very useful. And, and so pointing out this paper that you can do. And oh, here's the, here's the cross correlation between one last pretty picture between galaxy galaxy lensing and uh, galaxy clustering, angular galaxy clustering. Uh, red is theory and blue is simulations. They're non trivial cross correlations between these two probes. 
Um, and we don't have a theory that can predict them. So that's, I'll just leave that as the fine. This is, this is the nature of our problem. And I need a million simulations to tell you what it is. OK, so. This will be especially useful for um, things coming up in the collaboration meeting later in the week. So these slides are all, all uh, up, they're yeah. all on conference yeah. now. So you can review them at your leisure.